Hey guys, Kevin here with the Honey Badger. So it's mid-season, and this is probably not how you expected a mid-season uh, check to go, but uh, we had some fun. So uh, motor's good, no problems there. Things run fantastic. Did not drop it in order to do anything on the motor specifically. It was actually these guys, so these headers. So you'll, if you've watched any of my previous videos, you'll know that before I had uh, them wrapped, similar to the exhaust pieces over here. Well, that's worked great for the parts that are underneath the main body of the car. It didn't work for the headers because as I learned from um, an unfortunate experience that once this stuff gets really, really hot, it gets very brittle, which is normally fine, except if your headers rub on anything. So I am having some problems with my headers rubbing, and by some problems I mean like a lot of problems. So the, the headers are rubbing a lot, not because there's really particularly any area where they're, the clearances are super tight. I think it's just because the now with the work I've done to the car, the motor's just flexing a lot, like a lot, a lot. So uh, I, had, I had more than a quarter inch of clearance in the tightest of spots uh, and everywhere. And it was still managing to, to torque over and, and hit the side of the car. So if we take a look, if we take a look at the primary areas here, so inside the engine bay here, if we take a look at the primary areas right here, this isn't really surprising. This is the middle of the K member or the middle, of, sorry, the middle of the header. And then if you look back there, it's the big one. That's where I was having the most. So that was actually um, here along the, the frame rail going down the side. And then there was a little bit right here. And then if we look up here with all that scratch, part of that is me where the header was actually making contact. And then part of it was me trying to get the header back out of the car. That's a whole different story. So long story short, the header was rubbing uh, primarily in three areas uh, there on the side of the car. And like I said, everywhere had more than a quarter of an inch of room and the engine's torquing over was still doing it. So I'm running OEM motor mounts and this is not something that I felt on the street and it's not something I even felt at a track like MSR Houston. It wasn't until I got to tracks like VIR, Road Atlanta, um, and then of course Coda was pretty bad as well, where the G-forces are a little higher and sustained and, and longer. So. I started to have rubbing um, that you could, I'm pretty sure that's what I was feeling in the car uh, with a like a metallic -y, uh, vibration and such in the car. So I started to inspect the headers and, and I took them off and I'll show you some footage of them now, but they're, they were literally, the, the material was literally just like sloughing, sloughing, sloughing off, falling off more or less. Uh, you could just like grab a piece of it and pull in the whole like it would just come off in bundles. It was terrible. That was a terrible call for the headers themselves. So I ended up uh, going to remove the long tubes and I found out that you cannot get the long tubes out of the car with the engine still in the car um, if you had the FP350S oil pan. The oil pan's just so wide down here. This little part that juds out extra compared to the standard oil pan just gets in your way and you're not able to pull the the uh, long tubes out of the way. At least I couldn't. I wasn't able to figure it out. So what I did is I ended up just driving the whole K member because I, I messed up the gaskets for uh, the, the headers. I got myself in this. I made a huge mess and I was like, okay, this is just not me to try to you know, either put this back together or mess it up even further. So I went ahead and just dropped the whole engine out of the car. I have two months between events, so I was like, yeah, screw it. Dropped the engine out of the car. It was a good chance to kind of look at things, see how things were wearing, and, you know, see if there's anything I want to be concerned or worried about, as well as just, you know, fix this header issue once and for all. All right, so first up is obviously going to be the headers here. As you can see, I got, I took these to Polydyne, uh, or I think it, the full name is Poly, Polymer Dynamics in uh, Houston it was about $370 to get these things coated uh, it was really sweet because they you know they have a great warranty on them and they coated them inside and out so it's not just the outside they actually cleaned the inside of the headers and then coated the inside as well so this should one of the important parts about thermal coating is you're supposed to have it coated inside and out not just on the outside which is why this isn't really something you should do yourself so I took it there they did a great job they look fantastic you know if we take a look in here it'll be hard to show you guys but if you look in there you can see that they're coated and you know I stuck a camera in there and got a pretty good view and you can see they're coated all the way in so very very nice job from these guys you'll also see that I have some areas here where I bashed them in a little bit 
Um, you know, there are obviously ways that this can be done a lot cleaner and stuff, but to me, this is a race car and I honestly don't really care. So the headers perform well. I just heated it up and, you know, and tapped it smooth, gave myself plenty of clearance. Um, each area where I had a rub or a potential rub, I added a good at least quarter of an inch of clearance. So I have no problems that, or I have no fears now that we'll have any rub. So. All right, the second change that I made uh, is going to be the heater core bypass. So normally coming out of, you know, here out of the driver's side head and the passenger side head, you have tubes that run along the, the top here next to the valve cover, and they go actually go up into the back there and go into the heater core that's inside the car. When I put the engine back in the car and obviously removed all the HVAC stuff, when I put the engine back in the car in April, I think it was April. I ran it around the back. I basically just spliced two. I spliced the two original hoses together and and ran around the back. Uh, that worked great, but I mean that worked fine for more or less. But you know, there's no reason to have uh, hot coolant going around this the, around the back and. It just adds heat soak, potential heat soak, as well as the tabs that I had were the OEM tabs, the locking tabs on the quick locks here. And I actually had one come off on me when I was dynoing the car and it shot coolant all over the guy's shop. So it never failed on me on track and I don't think it was a fail. I think it was actually a bad install. But ever since that happened, I decided to, you know, just, I was like, all right, next time I'm, you know, doing this type of stuff, it's time to replace that. So I bought new tabs. These are let's see if I can remember I think it was three quarter inch um, yeah three quarter inch uh, female side but and a five eighths male side so five eighths in five eighths of an uh, five eighths inch hose to three quarter inch um, you know metal tab here that's what you're looking for I just then ran a piece of hose and then this what you're seeing over here is a heat sleeve just to add some extra insulation between the hot water that's gonna be going between the two heads and you know the top of the intake here ideally that would be there would be an even better way to do that maybe rounding it down through here and over and stuff like that and that's something I'm going to explore in the future when I convert this to AN fittings but for now this should work all right so the second thing is going to be the engine harness so you'll notice if you look at the engine right now there's no engine har engine harness on it and that's because my second engine harness had a problem so when I was at Road Atlanta the the last day or I should say, before I left for the trip, to back up further, before I left for the trip of VIR and Road Atlanta, the car started to misfire on, I think it was cylinder uh, two, I believe. Cylinder two, it started to misfire. I ended up swapping injectors and it went away, so I assumed that was it. The car worked fine the whole time until the very last day at Road Atlanta. Uh, when I was uh, going out for my, I think, fourth session of the day, it started to burble again and started to misfire. Fortunately, we were running out of tire. The, that issue I was having with Magnum Ride had gotten to the point where it was debilitating, and I was like, all right, I'm, I'm done. I'll, this is fine. I'll head home. So I got home, and I actually found out it ended up being one of the connections going to the uh, injectors. Let's see if I can find it here. Yep, so here we go. So this injector, or this, I traced it to a bad connection going to the injector. So you can see here's what the, you know, the OEM plug looks like. And I spliced in a new one. So it was like, okay, so fine, that fixed that. But after that experience, and this being my second engine harness, um, I decided, I was like, all right, it's time to just buy another engine harness that has no problems in it, put that on the car, and then carry this one around just in case anything goes wrong while I'm at the track and I can just swap it over. Obviously, this isn't something I would probably do in between sessions because you do have to remove the intake if the engine is in the car. But if it's something like where you're on a trip or something like that, it's actually not too bad, just a couple hours worth of work. So that's the third thing I've done is I've replaced the engine harness. All right, so let's take a quick look here at the fourth thing that I want to show you, which is the cylinder head uh, coolant lines that I've added. These are from the FP350S engine. Um, they're 3 h inch hard lines that connect the two cylinder heads and allow oil to pass through uh, under high G load and help balance out oil temperatures out on track. So taking, let's take a quick uh, close look here at the connection. So I have a one quarter inch NPT male to a 90 degree uh, dash 6 AN uh, male. So Three, uh, one quarter inch MPT to dash six, uh, it's a 90. And then I have a dash six female to three H inch hardline crimp. 
I'll put the connections in the uh, video description so it's a little bit easier for you. Uh, or it's, it makes more sense and you can just quickly uh, run through the parts list. All right, and so the last part of this to talk about are gonna be the CMCV IRMC lockouts that I've installed from MMR. So this, the way I routed this actually interfered with the CMCV and IRMC actuators that sit on the back of the intake. So I deleted those because one, they're not really needed for a track only car. There are these butterfly valves inside the intake manifold that close at low RPM and open at high RPM to cr they help create uh, vacuum manifold pressure and make the car more drivable at low RPM. This isn't needed for a track car, so I deleted them. So missing off the back of the intake here are those two big bulky roundish actuators, four connectors, uh, two for sensors, and then two to control the, the actuators themselves, and a bunch of vacuum lines. I've deleted all of that from the back here, which gives me the room needed to run these oil lines uh, freely not have to worry about interfering with anything and it deletes some complications off the back of the intake and makes things a much cleaner install. So the last thing I want to cover before I end this video was some modifications I made to the exhaust. Uh, another major just uh, some things I did because I noticed uh, when I was at tracks like Road Atlanta and uh, VIR, specifically Road Atlanta is where I noticed it the most, and I jumped a few curbs, um, some by some on purpose and some by accident. I was actually dragging these on the ground. So if you look right there, um, let me see if I can get you a good, good angle. That was way too much. All right, there you go. So if we look right there, you can see where I've actually um, dragged these uh, resonators on the ground. So as you can see, the resonators are a little bit bigger. I think they're about four inches in diameter versus three here. So um, they they are a little lower to the, to the ground and therefore they're more susceptible to hitting things, especially when you're under max compression because you're, you know, you're jumping over a curb by accident or going off road. So I wanted to, to get this a little further up into the car um, and a little bit more tucked away and protected. So what I did actually is I added these little exhaust hangers. These are super uh, cost effective. I think they're like nine bucks each. And I just tapped into the subframe here and then I welded it onto this pipe here, or I should say onto my uh, resonator pipe here. I just put a little weld here. And this holds it up about another three quarters of an inch to an inch, which is great because that should give me the extra ground clearance. So while at Road Atlanta, I was mostly concerned with if I go flying off the track, there are times, depending on what time of the year you're at Coda, they put out these big sausage curbs on the runoff uh, to discourage Formula One and IndyCar drivers from using the, you know, outside the curb, essentially. And while they don't, obviously, at a track day where I'm there, they don't give a crap about track limits. So we typically use them if we can, and sometimes, um, when there or I should say we use we go outside the track limits and sometimes when we're there and those big curbs are there you uh, if you don't hit the corner right you need to straddle them you don't really want to drive over them because they're pretty aggressive and they'll really uh, mess you up but you do want to drive over them and I would not feel comfortable driving over them with this exhaust when it was hanging down lower because I know I'll hit them because I have hit them um, I found that out at Coda the last time I was there so this should give me the ground clearance I need now. So it's really nice that, you know, if we take a look here, there isn't really any part of the exhaust that's any lower now than the rest. So that's nice. Um, <clears throat> and then just to show you what it, what it looks like, I have a little bit of oil cleanup to do from when I was tightening down some connections up there. But if you look here, we can see we have really, really good clearance now. I'm not sure how well this is coming through, but okay, let's try that. Yeah, so you can see we have really good clearance now with the frame rail there, which is, oh, there you go. You can just see it. That was really easy to touch, you know, when the engine would torque over, it would hit. So great, great clearance there, which is nice. Um, you can see we're very, very close. Oh, it would help with the starter there. Um, I, I added a little bit of clearance there, so we're good there. So we're clearanced everywhere. So I, I have very good confidence now that we won't have the, the headers rubbing into anything. So I'm really, really happy with how this turned out. And it'll be really nice when I start this up and get everything nice and hot to see the temperature difference. You know, I rewrapped everything back here now, um, as well as added these. So I originally, one other note real quick, is I originally had these wrapped, uh, the resonators wrapped with the exhaust wrap. 
and it was just absolute hell because as soon as the resonator started rubbing on the ground it disintegrated and i actually got it caught in the you know the axles in the back and that was just a bad idea so we're gonna go with this method see how this works out i would like a little you know uh, insulation here because it is next to the fuel tank so it is nice to have that little bit of extra room here but i'm really happy with where this turned out and how it looks so i think we're in good shape hey guys so i thought i would end this video talking through the feedback from how the how the shakedown runs went since i was able to get out on track on friday and and run four sessions to kind of see how things worked out so the good news is i have no evidence of the headers rubbing on anything anymore so fantastic news there don't have to worry about that uh, the car ran great the engine was fantastic the changes we made to this cmcv slash irmc uh, valves, actuators, whatever you want to call them, seem to work out great. One of the things I, I don't think I mentioned in the video, but uh, earlier in the video, I should say, is to fix or to run that change, you will need a tune change. Uh, if you're like me and you've already worked with a tuner, it's not too bad. If this is a stock car that doesn't have a tune on it, do not do that change. You'll you'll wreak havoc in it. This isn't as simple as just suppressing a code. They actually the the tune itself will need to be changed to. Uh, no longer utilize those valves. Uh, so I worked with Sean at AED Tuning, who, di who did the tuning on this motor, and he was able to send me revised tunes that were um, were able to work with it. Um, and I'd say the only the only place I noticed the dif the fact that those were deleted was at very low RPM when I was just cruising around, you know, like in the paddock. It was really easy to stall the car comparatively to how it was before. So what I did is I raised the idle of the engine from I think it was at 650 to 800. This smooth smooth things out the car ran um it was much easier to kind of putz around and you know kind of do little uh you know, like take off very slowly or pull into the trailer that type of stuff it's a little sensitive before that uh, and then lastly would be the oil lines that ran between the two heads so as i mentioned in the video earlier the goal with that was to a allow oil under high g load to um, not get trapped in the back of the cylinder head there as well as make sure that uh, we had good circulation at the back there you know cylinders uh, four and eight are well known for being running very very hot and i just wanted to make sure that uh, i could i i just wanted to you know copy what I was seeing the FP350S do, add that relief there, make sure oil was moving around and make sure we, you know, do the best I could to remove hot spots. And I'm happy to say that I couldn't get oil temps, or I should say, I couldn't get cylinder head temps above 223, which is really, really good because I frequently run uh, with this car at, you know, 235, 236 or higher. Like I, I never seen the 220s during a track session. Uh, for cylinder head temps once i've got going i wasn't able to get it above that in a 30 minute session in you know 93 94 degree heat so i'd say that's a win the real test will be next month when i go to coda that track pushes you know the car a lot harder it runs at wide open rpm a lot more so we'll see for sure there but so far so good it you know it looks like a really good um, change and upgrade and i'm very excited about it So as always, guys, uh, if you have any questions about anything in the video or any feedback or anything like that, please drop me a comment or send me a message or anything like that. I'm happy to help out, provide feedback, answer questions, all that kind of good stuff. So in the meantime, hopefully I get to see you out at the track or, you know, we able to chat online or something like that. Feel free to send me videos. I'm always game to watch stuff and, you know, help out and, and you know, do what I can to contribute to the community. So uh, thanks for watching. Uh, hope to catch you later.